Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. All right, let's bring on tonight's guest. Tonight's guest is Chewy. Chewy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Vic, for having me on. Well, thanks so much for coming on. You know, we really appreciate your time. Chewy, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I'm 36 years old, and I am a full-time pastor here at my church. Our church has a private school, a Christian school, and I'm part of the administrative team for this school, like helping oversee it and whatnot. And um, I've been married going on 11 years. I have two daughters. One is um, nine years old. She just turned nine and the other uh, just turned five years old. And I'm a, just an average guy, love the outdoors, love to go fishing, hiking, camping, making great memories of my family here where we live. You're obviously a man of faith. What kind of effect have your encounters had on that? Well, it for sure strengthened our faith as a family. And it just kind of reminded me of what I do for a living, that there's more out there than, you know, what the general public wants to acknowledge. And there's a lot of things that we don't know out in this world. And so just with this encounters that we've had it, It really opened up my eyes more to what's out here in this world. Well, as you found out, there are a lot of things out there in the world that most people don't know about. They never will either. Before you had your first dogman encounter, you were interested in Bigfoot, but had you heard about dogman before that first experience with a dogman? Nope, I've never heard of dogman. That term kind of sounded awkward to me. I was like, what is that? When I heard the term dogman, I had a different kind of picture in my mind and but i i have heard of you know like the wolf man and my grandma being from michigan and telling me stories as a kid about the wolf man over there but yeah i've never heard of a dog man and the stories my grandma told me was i really never took them serious it was you know just kind of like an old wife's tale of what i thought she was telling me but yeah i found out that that was far from from fiction, it was actually a reality. Yeah, it's all too easy to think that dogmen are fiction until you've got one looking at you, so no, I definitely get it. You live in an interesting part of Idaho, Chewy. What more can you tell us about that? Well, I live, to be specific, I'm in Twin Falls, Idaho, which is southern Idaho, and I live in the Magic Valley. It's interesting because it's a desert area, this valley is is a desert and i'm surrounded by the sawtooth mountains and it's beautiful area you know that we cut down our christmas tree and so i'm not far from the mountains at all but in this desert it's beautiful area as well but the city is built right on the rim of this huge canyon and this canyon is actually deeper than the grand canyon the part that's the deepest is called uh a Hell's Canyon, which is a lot of weird stuff happens down there, a lot of encounters. And when you go down into this canyon, um, it's just beautiful. You know, we have the Shoshone Falls, which is like the Niagara of the West. People come from all around to visit this area. And the large canyon is, I believe, one of the only places that you can uh, base jump year round. And so there's a lot of base jumpers and it's a really big area for uh, thrill seekers like that. And the canyon breaks off, or I like to say it, it spider webs off and there's a bunch of little ones that go throughout our town and throughout the Magic Valley. And um, one of the little ones is actually like 300 yards from my house. And when you go down there, it looks like you're in a jungle basically since we're in the desert and then you go in the canyon 
is so much greenery and it's just really beautiful. The part that's by my house, it kind of reminds me of like the movie, The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit with all these huge spidery trees. And it's just a beautiful area. And it's cool because it's just down the street from my house. And just outside of Twin Falls, we have some cave systems, the Mammoth Caves, and then we have the Lava Caves. And the Lava Cave is, is actually, from what I've researched, the largest lava cave in the world. And it's just a huge, massive cave, and it goes really, really deep, but they only let the general public go down about half a mile. And then I've gone there, and it's just beautiful. And people say that the cave connects to the canyon. There's different, because you can go down to the canyon, any part of this area, and look, and you can count caves. There's five cave openings right there. You go you look the other way, there's another five. It's just endless caves and I mean, the canyon is, is really deep. The bridge here is, it's, I know it's over 200 feet. So there's caves that are like, you can't even get to them. Nobody can get to them. And I just, I just wonder like what creatures or what animals live in these caves. And if it does connect to the largest lava cave in the world, it's, um, which I think it does. And I've heard a lot of stories from the Native Americans that the caves, they do connect to the canyon. It sounds like a beautiful area to me, but unfortunately, it also sounds like a perfect habitat for dogmen. Yeah, it's good on one hand, but on the other hand, not so good. People in your area have a nickname for what might be a dogman or dogmen. Please talk us through that. There's a lot of stories of what the locals call the whistling bear. And basically, this bear that is often witnessed they associate it with the bear because, you know, it has a snout and the ears and it walks on two legs. And when they see it, they often hear it whistling. And this canyon, it, it goes to Jawbridge, Nevada, it connects to Utah. This canyon system goes for hundreds of miles, literally. And yeah, there's a lot of stories about this um, bear that walks on two legs and it, it travels up and down the canyon. And it's, it's been seen way way far away from where i live and it's been seen just like i said 300 yards from my house and that part of the cave system but people associate it with um they say it's a bear that just has learned how to walk and run on two legs well listening to that description it sure does make you wonder if they're not talking about a dog man more than likely they are all right chewy please tell us about the encounters you and your family have had now give us every last detail that comes to mind all right. Well, I recently moved to this part of town. You know, we bought our house in 2017 and um, it's just a beautiful area. And on this canyon that's, you know, not too far from where I live, it's a beautiful area. You know, inside the canyon, there's a trail, there's several trails, that, you know, you go hiking, beautiful sh fishing spots, you know, me and my daughter's go on that sorry daughter daddy dates and we go fishing and hiking down there so it's a beautiful area and on the canyon rim there's also a trail where you can walk on the rim of the canyon or go for bike rides and so just a really beautiful area and when we first moved here we walked down there my wife and my two daughters and we were walking on this canyon rim and i wanted to kind of go down into the canyon and there was a gentleman that lives closer to the canyon than I do and I asked him I said hey is there a trail that goes down to the canyon from here and he says no he goes you you don't want to go down to this part he goes you want to go to the main entrance of the canyon which is you have to drive a ways and go across a bridge and go to the opposite side and and it goes down and so for me, I just was like, oh, all right, thank you. And we just walked anyway down there just to look. And sure enough, we found a trail, which I thought was odd because it was right there where this guy was at. And we go down there about halfway and the terrain starts getting pretty rugged. So we come back up and we go back home and, and then we go walking again about a week later. And I believe it was a city that put up a giant fence on that part of the canyon with these big welded bars and they have a bunch of signs of you cannot cross you know no trespassing or and it was really strange because it was like wow it's that's odd that i was just down there and 
And all of a sudden they put this giant fence there. And I was at church on that Sunday and I met a good friend of mine who had a Bigfoot sticker on his truck. And we began talking about Bigfoot and exchanging stories. And he's a man of faith and I'm a man of faith. And we both believe in these creatures. And and so then I started telling him about this canyon, how they put this barred fence down. And, and then he began to tell me about all his encounters that he's gathered of uh, Bigfoot sightings down here in this canyon because he's a federal investigator and he works for the Department of Environmental Quality. So his job is outside all the time. He's always outside and doing investigations for the and so he he hears a lot of stories and and that's one of his hobbies. He gathers a lot of info. And it's pretty cool because he he approaches it in a like an through an investigator standpoint, which is pretty cool. And so I began to tell him about this fence and he's like, Oh, that's strange. You know, maybe we should get together and, and go down there one day and just check it out. And also between this time, on the opposite side of the canyon, like directly on the opposite from where I live, is the Livestock Commission. And so they have a lot of beef cattle that they keep on the top of the canyon. You know, they don't let them go underneath the canyon. But oftentimes I've seen the beef cattle have escaped somehow and they've gone down in the canyon. And I remember hearing one one evening just this one of these beef cattle sound like it was just getting eaten alive. It was just screaming and screaming and I could hear like gurgling. It was really, really shocking. And so I, I told him that too. And he goes, Oh man, we should definitely go down there just to see if, if we have any evidence or even to look for this cow, if it's still down there. So we decide to go down there and it's, you know, we don't want to be down there in the dark. So we didn't take flashlights. We weren't planning on staying that down there till nighttime. But we meet at my house, and again, the canyon's 300 yards from my house, so we jump in my Explorer, and, and we have to drive around to the opposite side, to the main entrance of this canyon. So we drive over there, and we just start walking down. We go down to this canyon, and we go to the general area where I heard that cow screaming and where the fence was put up. And we start going back there and, and there's these signs again down there that, that is blocked off and it says no trespassing and, you know, a big, huge fence. And with him and his job, he's actually gone down there to, to investigate and to look at the water quality down there for, you know, for his job. And so he goes, Oh, it's fine. We can go down here. If, if uh, they say anything, he goes, I'll just show him my credentials and it will be good. So we go down there and we start walking and. We're talking, having a good time, and and uh, we get farther and farther into this canyon, and we take these um, grass. You can pick, you know, some grass and put them between your thumbs, and you can do like wounded rabbit calls or just different kind of creature calls. And so we started doing that, and um, just you know, just messing around, and then we heard this giant growl come from inside the the bushes like it it was farther back there I'd, I'd probably say maybe about 30 feet in front of us we heard this big growl and my thought was I, I'm like man that's a mountain lion you know because there are mountain lions down in the canyon they they're they're often spotted we recently had one that um, went into town in a little town of Kimberly that connects the Twin Falls from all these forest fires and stuff and so that actually went into town and they had to euthanize it. So we were thinking like, oh, you know, it's maybe a mountain lion. My thought was, I hope it's just a mountain lion kind of a thing. So we began to back it up. And right when we're backing it up, there's a tree next to us. And and I look up this tree and this tree is just shredded about 10 to 12 foot up. I mean, I mean, really, it looks like somebody took a chainsaw to this tree 10 12 foot up and so it was really really weird it, it reminded me like of a if a grizzly bear were to shred a tree but we don't have grizzlies in this part of idaho they're more in, um in the northern side of idaho and so we we just decided we we're going to back up and go the other way and so we back up and we go the other way we didn't hear anything we just heard the growl and saw the tree and so we, we thought it was kind of wise for us to go the other way. So we start walking the other way and we're having a good time. You know, when you're in, in good company, time seems to, to fly by. So that's kind of what happened. And 
we were about an hour away from my vehicle and then it starts to get dark. Um, before we knew it, it was already getting dark and above the canyon, it could be the sun will be setting, but inside the canyon, it can, it can be dark already. So it started to get really dark and we didn't have any flashlights and we had our phones and they have flashlights, but our batteries were really low. So we thought, you know what, let's just let our eyes get accustomed to the darkness. In case we have an emergency, we got to make a phone call. We don't want to kill our, our phones. So we start walking and once we get into this canopy area, um, cause there's, there's trees all down there, but there's certain parts of this canyon where it's just completely covered, um, with, by trees and it, it makes this canopy. And inside that canopy, it's really, really dark. You know, the, the moonlight really doesn't show in there. So our eyes were kind of getting accustomed to it and, and we're walking on this trail and this trail is about 30 feet wide. You know, it, it has, the actual trail itself and maybe 10 feet on each side before the tree line starts. And we're walking down there and I'm a, and I start getting on edge. I just have this, um, like this, I like to call it the heebie jeebies. I start feeling like, Oh man, this is, what am I doing down here? Kind of a thing, you know? And I didn't have a firearm. He had a firearm and I just had a pocket knife. And so we're walking down there and I start getting the creeps and and he mentioned something too, like, you know, it's, um, it's really weird down here and we didn't hear any birds because there's always, you can hear rock truck screams. You can hear the birds, the magpies. I mean, a lot of, a lot of, uh, wildlife down there. But when we got in this canopy, it was just quiet. And then, and then the creep factor really started to set in. And so we're, I'm pretty close to him and cause he's done this several times, you know, he's, this is not his first rodeo and this was mine, my first time. So I didn't want to be the guy that's like, okay, I'm getting scared. Let's go now, you know, and we're just wanting to see if we found any tracks. We're looking in the dirt and the mud. We were looking on the, the creek bed and we saw a bunch of, you know, coyote tracks and raccoon tracks and stuff. And so we're walking and maybe about, 50 75 feet in front of me i see this giant black mass on the side of the trail and it's i'm looking at it and i'm like man this is a it has to be a stump or a small tree or something and I, that's what my i was thinking in my mind and we're just walking and all of a sudden this this black mass what i saw and it, and again it's black down there it's dark but this thing was so dark. It was darker than the darkness around it. It was really weird. And all of a sudden it just took like, I, I could see it was bipedal. It was took three, three steps and it crossed this 30 foot trail. And so my heart dropped and I, it was so dark. I'm like, no, my eyes are playing tricks on me. Please, Lord. And my friend says, a creature just passed the trail in front of us and my heart just dropped. And I, and I want, you know, when, when you, when somebody confirms your worst fear, you're hoping you're not seeing what you're seeing and you don't say a word and somebody stops you and they, and they confirm what you saw. So my heart just dropped and I turned around and I was going to run and he grabbed me. He's like, don't run. He goes, don't run. It's going to make it worse. And, and it crossed when it crossed, it went into the, into the deep uh, brush and the trees and and we and we stopped in our tracks and then we could hear a growl like i could hear a growl like a low growl and and we we started backing it up and we could hear it breaking uh sound like it was breaking branches or something i don't know if it was stepping on the fallen branches or what or, or if it was doing that just to let us know it was there or i don't know what it was doing but we could hear it and it was paralleling us and so we were backing up and we could hear it and it sounded like there was more than one, like it was coming from more than one spot, but it was so black. We just couldn't see anything, but we could hear it and we, we knew it was there. So we backed out and, and we just kept walking and walking and we'd stop and, and it would stop. And then we'd back up again and then we could hear it walking again. And so we knew that something was there and it was following us. And so, and, and again, I'm, I'm already terrified and, you know, he's the one with the firearm and, and, um, and I just have that pocket knife and, and I just want to tell you guys, my pocket knife was out. It was in my hand. I don't know what it, 
damage it could have done, but it, I had it just as, I guess, security for me. And he had his firearm in his hand. You know, he wasn't pointing it, but he had it in his hand and we're backing out. And this thing followed us all the way out of this canyon. And it did not come out of the canopy. You know, once we got out of the canopy area, the moonlight, you could see a little better and it would not come out. It stayed back there. And once we got to a, where we thought it was a safe distance from this canopy, we booked it out there, you know, and, and you know, when people say, hey, I'm a grown man, I don't run from anybody or anything. Well, I tell you that day we ran, we ran back to my, uh, to my vehicle and we got in and we drove to my house in a kind of in a, in a, in a shock kind of. So we came here to my house and, you know, for special occasions, I got a, a nice, a nice bottle of, um, of some bourbon, some, some nice bourbon. And so I open it up and I pour me and him a glass and, and we start sipping on it and, and we're in shock. And I'm telling him like, dude, what just happened? You know, did that, did that really just happen? We just saw that thing and it followed us. And he's like, yeah, man, he goes, it, we saw it. And, and it wasn't a shock. I was so in shock because it's down the street from my house. And as we're discussing it, this thing, and we went down there um, sometime afterwards to the same spot. And we were like measuring how tall it was and everything and how it could cross that wide of a distance in three steps. You know, we're like, man, this thing was huge. So we estimated it to be around eight to nine feet tall. And just the bulk of it, man, it had to be like four, 400 pounds or something just just from the bulk of it. And, and he's hunted his whole life and he knows, and he, he gave me those estimations too, as, as how much it weighed and how big it was. And we didn't see any tracks there. Cause of course we waited, uh, I think it was like, a we waited a while before we went back down in the daytime. And, but we, that's what we saw that night. And, and I came home when we came home, I didn't tell my wife really anything. My wife um, doesn't, she didn't believe in this stuff. You know, she thought it was just a, just kind of like a, a hobby where, you know, like she really didn't take it seriously. And so um, I told her, Hey, we had a little bit of action down there. We saw something and she just kind of brushed it off. Like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm glad you are, you're making friends or whatever. And you guys are, are having a good time out there in the wilderness. And so we leave it at that. And about a week later, um, my in the morning my wife tells me she says hey she was chewy um something was on our roof last night and and i tell her, like what do you mean something was on our roof she was like i heard a big thump on our roof it was right above our bedroom like right where our bed was at a matter of fact she said it was right above us and she could hear it walking there was something up there and, and whatever it was she said that she was frozen in fear that she couldn't move, she couldn't talk, she could just hear this thing walking. And she was trying, she, she was going to try and wake me up, but you know, she couldn't move. And so she, it, she waited a while and she said that she was kind of in a weird, like a trance. Like if you go to, like she was wondering, was I dreaming or was I just coming out of sleep? Like what was going on? So she kind of just brushed it off and went to sleep. And so when she told me, um, it was snowing all night, you know, so I go out there and I look and there's, there's tracks right on my roof, right where she says, and I, and, and of course the snow covered them, but I could still see them. And I looked on the house next to me and there's also, um, the same tracks are on that roof and it's like going towards the Canyon. And so I'm like, I'm blown away. I'm trying to figure out like, no, this has got to be like a bird or something you know because i have vaulted ceilings you know my my house is really tall and so i i just can't figure out how something can get up there you know how it can jump or whatever how you know what what could have been it had to have been a bird my thought was because i put christmas lights on every year and, and i have a huge ladder and even going up there is really you know i'm not a fan of heights but it's really high house it's tall and so I just was like, kind of brushed it off and I was like, man, it had to kind of unexplained thing, you know, it had to have been an owl or something. And so another week or so passes by and something wakes me up about three or four in the morning, like a thump. I hear the thump and I, and I wake up and I, and, and I don't hear anything, but I know something woke me up, 
you know, so, you know, that saying the thump in the night, you know, or a bump in the night, that's what was going through my head. And of course, I thought about the week before of her hearing something on her roof. So my mind was thinking that I just hear something. Is that where I heard the thump from? So I go and I check my daughter's rooms. They're sleeping like, you know, little bugs in a rug. They're all cozy. It's, it's winter time. And, and I check the doors, the doors are locked, the windows are locked and I open the blinds, don't see anything outside. Um, I turn on, off and on my outside lights. No, I don't hear anything, see anything. So I wait a little bit and I go back to bed. And in the morning when I wake up, uh, the snow has stopped. You know, it was it was still a lot of snow. But I decided just to go out there and look again. I just had like a feeling like, man, you know what? I'm going to go look. So I go out there and sure enough, man, there's these tracks on my roof again. But this time the snow didn't cover them. There was no fresh snowfall after the tracks. And like I said, my roof is so tall. Um, I didn't, I didn't want to get up there with all that snow. It's really slick and all that. So I kind of stood, I went to the other side of my fence and took a picture of these tracks and I zoomed in on them and, and they were just the weirdest tracks. They, they, to me, they look like triangles. Like there was a, the top part was wide and it narrowed down to like a really narrow almost like a point on one end and i could see them like it was walking on two legs and there was a lot of um like the snow was moved around a lot and but you could see where there was footsteps and it looked like it was like a at the time i was like man is is though are those like dog thing like dog prints or my thought was like no it look they look more human i just couldn't get a good good look at them and I was freaked out, you know, I was like, man, what's, what the heck is going on here? So I called my good friend who I went down to the Canyon with and I, and I told him, I'm like, Hey man, you need to come over here and check this out a couple of weeks ago or whatever. Something was on our roof and, and I heard something last night and I found tracks up there. So he comes over, he takes one look at these and he's like, Oh my gosh. And I tell him, I think a uh, Bigfoot followed us home. I think it followed me home, bro, and it and it's been on my roof a couple of times. And that one look he took, he goes, he goes, Chewy, he goes, those are not Bigfoot tracks. He goes, those are Dogman tracks. And I'm like, whoa, what Dogman? And I've never heard the term Dogman before. And he told me he's like, it's like a werewolf. It's like a a wolf that walks on two legs, like a person. And I'm like, what? Like like a werewolf? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, no way. I'm like, not. My mind is just like, what's, what the heck is going on here? So I get online and I, and I Google it and I see the term dog man and I listen to a podcast on YouTube or something. And like the first one I pull up, man, talks about a winter encounter where this dog man was on somebody's roof in the winter time and it left tracks up there. And so my mind was just blown. I just, my heart dropped and I thought like, what the heck is going on here? I was like, this, is is this real like is really like something was on my roof i mean i'm looking at the tracks but i i can't i can't put it together because i'm looking i walk around my house i don't see any scratch marks there's nothing and i'm like how in the heck can if this is one of these creatures how can it how can it get up there you know like do they jump that high or what like what's going on and so I, my mind just blew and I started researching and researching and it opened up a whole new world to me because I believed in Bigfoot, but I had no idea what there were other types of them. Any of that, I didn't know that, you know, these dog men were real. You know, my, like I said, my grandma's told me about the wolf man in Michigan. She, when she lived there as a kid, she said that their town, of, I think it was Saginaw, Michigan, that she lived on the outskirts, but she says that her family and the locals believed wholeheartedly that a werewolf or a wolfman, she called it, would eat the homeless people there, that they, that they would find the remains of homeless people um, that would travel the railroad system and it lived in the woods and it would, it would hunt on the railroad tracks. And so I've heard that before, but never the term dog man. And so it just really shook me up, man. It really did. And I didn't say anything to my family. I didn't want to freak them out. And because I still wasn't, I still wasn't sold on it 100%. You know, I was like, this is just way too out there, man. You know, it's Bigfoot is one thing, but 
a wolf that walks on two legs and has hands and stuff and and it follows you home you know like what does that what what follows you home you know that was really started messing with my mind i'm like well this thing if it's that thing i saw in the canyon then maybe it tracked me you know because i don't i live 300 yards you know maybe it tracked me or something and then i started thinking did it come that night and saw where i lived or all these scenarios are going in my mind and i didn't want to freak my family out so i didn't say anything to them man and i just kind of kept it as that and little things would happen in between like my daughter would would wake up at three in the morning four in the morning she would say that there was tapping on her window and I'm like, well, what it sound like? What do you mean tapping? And she said, it sounded like somebody picked up a rock and was tapping on my window. And, and my mind was like, mm, that's like a claw. Like, like, why would somebody pick up a rock? And her mind says, oh, it's something hard that was tapping. So my mind thought it was a claw. Like maybe it was one of these creatures that is still coming around. And it was tapping on my daughter's window. And so again, I go into researching and googling and doing all this stuff and i hear all these stories about these creatures trying to draw kids out or you know wanting them to come out and or whatever you know like it was kind of predatory and for me being a pastor and being a you know a man of god i believe that one of the darkest things you can do is hurt kids in any form or way if, if you abuse or hurt kids in my book um that's predatory and that, that directly relates to evil. And so for my little eight-year-old saying that something was tapping on a window at night, I went in, I, I kind of went into daddy mode. You know, I started like, well, what the heck? I started getting upset. Like, and, and part of me wanted to tell them and tell my family like, hey, this is happening. But I didn't, honestly, I didn't want to sound crazy, you know, going to my wife because I'm a pastor and, you know, I, I have a lot of people look up to me in my community. Um, I, you know, oversee a school that has hundreds of students. And it's just, you know, I can't go to, to my wife and say, hey, you know what, a, a werewolf or this this walking wolf followed us home and that was on our roof. And, and now it's tapping on the girls' window that night and stuff. So I didn't say any of that. I just started praying and just was just, my mind was the more I learned about it, the more prepared I could be, so to speak. So some time goes by and um, with this whole COVID stuff, my wife, you know, she's a teacher at, at our school and she was teaching online, you know, stuff on her computer and she's in the backyard. I built a really nice patio out there because, you know, here in Idaho and the winters are really, really harsh and I love to grill and barbecue. And so I built this patio for for winter time and stuff so to stop the rain and the snow so i can be out there grilling and stuff but she's out there working on her computer sitting in the chair and i have a a vinyl fence that's it's, it's at least seven foot and i'm here in my man cave and she comes rushing in crying telling me and to just kind of i can't understand what she's saying and but I know something bad happened, and she tells me that uh, a big dog head looked at her. It peeked over the fence and looked at her, and and she said it was just this big black head and it had big pointed ears. And she said in the corner of her eye when she first saw it, it was just black. And then she, when she looked at it, she seen the white, and she and she noticed the white was just its massive teeth that it had. This she says it had too much teeth for it, like it didn't look. Um, it wouldn't look right. Like it had so much teeth and she says she jumped and she was actually, um, she had to re-record her, uh, her lesson because she was doing a lesson. And when this happened, she, she almost knocked her computer down. She jumped, she screamed. And she said when she was trying to get off the chair, she looked back and it was gone and she came rushing inside and she's asking me, she's like, she goes, what? The? And she doesn't use bad language. And she goes, what the heck is going on? And she's looking at me and, and I'm, and she's crying and I'm trying to, you know, comfort her. And I go outside, rush out there and, and I'm looking over the fence. I'm looking in the backyard. I don't see anything. I, and I go to the front and I go back to look at the backyard and there's nothing out there. And so I come back in and, and she's just in hysterical. And then I just, I told her, I told her everything that happened and I felt so bad. 
because I, I felt like I, I was almost hiding it from her. And she was so mad at me. She's like, what did you do? She's like, what did you bring to our house, Chewy? And I don't know. I don't have answers. And I'm like, babe, I don't know. I didn't intentionally do this. I didn't, I didn't think that, that something would follow me home. And, and she was just freaked out. And, and I told like, babe, our fence is like seven foot tall. It's over seven foot. I can't even j- look over if I jump, but this thing looked at her over the fence and she said it looked right at her and it had a mouth full of, of freaking teeth. And she, she associated it with a black German shepherd kind of a thing, but its ears were like a Doberman pincher, how they have these Doberman pinchers have these, um, some of them have these massive big ears that are cropped. And she says, that's what it looked like, just these huge ears. And it was looking at her. And she was mad at me for a while, man, because, you know, asked, telling me, why would I hide this from her? If I thought it was this, why, why didn't I tell her? And, and I, and I was just at a loss for words, man, because as a father and as a husband, my job is to protect my family. And, um, excuse me, I'm trying not to get uh, cracked up here. Give me a moment. I'll tell you what, Chewie, let's take a break. We'll be right back. So, you know, my wife is, she's just in tears. She's crying and I don't have the answers for her. And I'm, I'm just, I don't know what to do. You know, what, I mean, what do you do in a situation like that? You know? And so, um, I try to do what I can and I, we buy the security system that goes, you know, every door has an alarm. Every window has an alarm. I get these massive lights to go outside and, and I'm just trying to do it. I, I can do best, you know, to help the situation. And, and, and it completely changes her. She will not go outside at night. And even me, when I got to go throw the garbage at night, I mean, I'm watching my back. I get freaked out just to go throw the garbage or to get something from the vehicle. Or when I go out to warm up my truck in the morning, that this stuff is always on my mind. And so we got this alarm system and we got some firearms. We, you know, we did some training, you know, took whatever safety uh, measures we, that I thought we can do, you know? And so we kind of left it at that and things were going okay. You know, no more tapping on the windows. It didn't show itself to her. And, um, I was another time I was here in my man cave and here in my garage, I got a little room in my garage where, where I do my studying for, you know, for my church and my school. And my kids come running inside, freaked out. Like they're, they're really, really scared. And they think they said that somebody was pounding on the fence and shaking the whole fence. And they thought it was me that was playing a joke on them. And they were really scared crying too, because it was really aggressive, they said. So I go out there and I look and it's in the middle of daylight, man. And there's nothing out there. There's, there's nothing. And so they're convinced that it was me. And I'm telling them it wasn't, it wasn't me. So I, I took my older daughter, I put her in the backyard and I went to the other side and I shook the fence and I pounded it. I go, is this what it sounded like? She's like, no, no. She goes, that's not even close. And so I'm shaking the fence and, and I guess my hardest, um, try at making this sound and shaking this whole fence didn't come close to, to what they heard and what they saw. They saw the fence shake and the pounding. And so they, they were really scared about that. And, and at this point, we, d- I didn't tell my, uh, my kids about this and just my wife and I, she's like, she's like, Oh, she's like, is it this thing again? She was, like, she was, it's coming back, huh? And I'm like, babe, we don't know. It could have been a prank, somebody messing with us. I, I don't know. And she's like, and she's like, well, that's it. You know, our kids are not going outside anymore. And she was, we're not going outside. She was like, what are we going to do? And I tell her, babe, I was like, we, you know, we can't let this stuff control us. You know, this is our property. This is our house, you know? And so little by little, they started going outside in the daytime, you know, and they would ask like, dad, why can't we go outside at night? You know, I'm like, no, you know, we stay inside at night. You know, once it starts to get dark, that's our family rule. We come inside. And so they started going outside. It started going well. And um, about 
I don't know, a, a little bit of time passed and um, my daughter and I um, decide, you know, when things start going smooth, we start coming back out of this. Um, we're not hermits anymore. We're like, okay, let's go outside. And because I live in Southern Idaho, man, and I live on this Canyon rim and this Canyon is just beautiful. I mean, there's people down there. There's people going for um, evening walks down there on the Canyon rim, evening walks, bike rides. And so finally in the daytime, my daughter and I were like, let's go for a bike ride. Let's, let's go, you know, down our street and, and we'll go on this Canyon rim and just go for a bike ride. And so she's like, okay, let's do it. And so there's this on, on the corner before we turn to get to this Canyon rim and it's a beautiful paved little trail on this rim. Beautiful. And there's this, uh, this German shepherd dog. It's like a pup. It's not a big dog. It, it still has one of its ears down, you know, like a, it's like, it's a kind of goofy looking dog and it's always holding its toy. When we ride our bikes or walk down there, it holds its toy in its mouth and it, and it wants, like, it wants us to play. But this house that's, that's pretty close to the canyon doesn't have a backyard. And so the dog is always playing there and stuff. And, and so he never barks or anything. So as we come around this corner, this dog is just barking and barking. And I've never heard him bark before. And he's just fixated on this certain part of this canyon. And there's raccoons, there's rock chucks, there's all kinds of critters down there. We, it's pretty cool because we, we often have deer that come out of the canyon and they literally will just walk by our front yard and then you know groups of them and stuff and so there's all kinds of critters down there so this dog is just barking and barking and i don't really at that moment i don't put two and two together like it's it's kind of been a while since anything as weird has happened and so this canyon trail part of it has a downward grade and my i put my daughter in front of me because if she falls or something happens it's downgrade and so i will go to her but if she's behind me you know something happens i have to ride uphill or or run uphill or whatever so she's in front of me and we're going down this canyon um or down this trail and she's about 20 30 feet in front of me and we get to this certain part um the same spot or across the street from the livestock commission where that barred fence is at she just jumps off I, I like to say she flies off her bike. You know, I've never seen her move that fast. She flew off her bike and she fell in these goat heads and she had all these goat heads on her, on her side. And that didn't stop her, man. She just rolled and ran the opposite way towards this German shepherd dog running to this dog. And she's screaming that it's there. She goes, it's there, it's there. And, and by the time I get down there, I stop my bike and I look and I see black fur and it's going down into the canyon. And again, this canyon, this part is pretty, it's pretty steep. You know, it has uh, this tree line and brush line on the rim. And then it's like, let's say a, a 15 foot drop off. And then there's a little bit of cliffs and another 20 foot drop off and, and so on and so on. And, but it's all covered in, in trees and bushes. And so I just see uh, this black fur and it's and it's going down into the canyon and so i jump off my bike and i run and i'm running with all my might man and she's still running and i'm screaming to her to go go and we get to the end where this corner's at and and i ask her i'm like what happened and we're looking at this canyon and she says that when she came down this that little area on the side of a of this bush or tree or whatever that was there that she saw a black bear she says that that it lunged at her. She said it, it turned its neck and it saw her and it came towards her. And when it seen me, it looked, it looked behind it and saw me coming and it ran back in the, in the bushes. And um, that's what she said. She jumped off and ran, but she was really adamant that it, she, in her mind, she says that it tried to grab me. And I'm asking her, well, what it looked like? And she says it had big black ears and a big nose or a snout, like a, like a black bear. And, and I'm, I'm asking her, like, was it standing up or what? She was, I don't know. She was, it just was so quick. She was, and it had a big neck. She was really adamant about that part, like a neck. And in my mind, I already have an idea of what this thing is. I don't think it's a bear that she saw. And she said the neck was just huge. Like, like if, uh, 
you know, like a, like a wolf has it almost like it, it's not a mane, but it has thicker hair around the neck area. And so that's what I was thinking. And I called, um, we were like, man, we left our bikes there and, and we went home, we walked home. And so I'm, I'm wrestling, like, what do I do? Like, what do I do? I tell my wife and my wife is again, she's, when these things happen, she, she gets really scared and really um, upset. And again, I, I don't know what to do. And I'm just trying to see how can I try and fix this or whatever, you know, and, but who am I going to call? You know, I can't call the police and say, Hey, there, this werewolf has been harassing us for, for months now. And, and now it just lunges itself at my daughter, you know, and um, they're going to put me in the asylum and, you know, I'll be mocked in my community and all this stuff. So I, I tell them what she said. My daughter said, I said, Hey, um, you know, my daughter saw a black bear and it lunged at her. And so the fishing game came to my house and, and I, and we went down to the Canyon area where it was and I showed them and they came, they had rifles, they had dark guns. They were like, like ready to rock. And, but they would not go into the bush. They wouldn't go to the Canyon rim and, and I'm showing them where it's at and they're looking, investigating and, and they said, well, whatever it was, um, didn't leave any tracks. There's no mud here. It didn't leave, there's no dirt in that area. There's no tracks. And, and the way the bush is, there was no snack. There was nowhere for its first snag, they said. And, and for me, hearing it, they're saying like this thing was intelligent, almost like it knew where to show itself, where it wouldn't leave any evidence. And, and this, the guy tells me, he goes, have you or your neighbors, um, had it heard any encounters or have you of a big black dog in the area? And, and I told him, I, I didn't say anything about a big, big black dog. And he goes, Oh, well, I'm just trying to see if maybe she saw a Labrador or something, a black Labrador. And I told the man, I don't think that was a Labrador she saw. And he, and there, he's like, okay, well, we can't put, um, bear traps here in this area because of the community. He says, so we're going to just talk to our supervisors and see if we can go down and track this thing and, um, and see if we can catch it. And he, and I'm like, all right. And he goes, but well, until, until then, he goes, don't come out here at night. Um, if you come in the daytime, come in groups and always make sure you make lots of noise. And so that was the end of that. But one part I did forget is my daughter was also mad about, mad at me too about seeing this bear because about a week or two weeks or so uh, before this bike ride, my, my kids were playing in the front yard. You know, we have our blinds open and, and, you know, we, we could see them, but she comes rushing in my oldest daughter. And she says, dad, dad, a bear just ran across the road down the street. And I'm thinking a bear. I'm like, are you sure? She goes, yeah, I saw it. It was all, like on four legs running. Like it was a bear. And, and I told her, babe maybe it was just like a um one of the dogs or something she was no no it was it was too big to be a dog it was a bear you know in our and behind our house there's a there's a really big field and there's a big pasture where there's horses right on right on this canyon rim and i told her well, maybe it was one of the horses got loose and that's what you saw running and she says no dad she was it was a bear and so i go okay you know and my thought honestly I didn't connect those dots then that maybe it was this creature. I, I really did think she misidentified something. So um, she was a kind of upset at me that I wasn't believing her, but I told her, I believe you saw something, but I don't think it was a bear. Maybe it was just a big dog or something. And so when we we're going on this bike ride and this thing lunges at her, my daughter is just crying and she's upset at me. And she's saying, I told you dad, it was a bear. I told you I saw a bear the, the other day. And I, and I apologized to her. I said, you know what? I'm really sorry for, uh, for doubting you. She, I told her, I was like, I know what you saw wasn't a dog or it wasn't a bear. And she's like, well, what do you mean? And I told her, you know what? Uh, me and mom have to have a talk with you. And, and I wrestled with this man. I did not want to say anything to her. I mean, cause it's, it's going to freak her out. She's, she was only eight years old. And, and I just, I, I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what to, you know, I was just in shambles. So we sit her down and we talked to her and, you know, her being, you know, growing up in church and having faith herself, we believe in, you know, in the good and the bad. We believe in negative, positive, light and dark. We believe in angels and the holy angels and the devil and, and the dark angels. And so 
there's a sense of already of of there's more out there than what people kind of know about you know we believe in paranormal supernatural stuff so that kind of opened the door for her to be more um susceptible to believing it and so we i talked to her mean mom we we sat her down and we told her and her eyes are just wide and she's and and maybe i shouldn't have told her i don't know you know maybe i should have just kept it on the dl and told her it was a bear and you know that all these things but i had to, i just felt so compelled like i had to tell her and i told her and and she just freaked out too and and i didn't tell her about the tapping on the window she brought it up she said was that the thing or was that the rock i heard um tapping on my window and i told her i don't know babe it's like i don't know if that's it or not and so our family's just in shambles we're freaking out nobody could help us more or less believe us you know they they didn't find the bear they couldn't find tracks they never found evidence of it and so we hunker down in our faith that's like the the best thing i could do was hunker down in my faith when and we decided we come up with a family plan uh we all of us go to our backyard and i um i break some branches from our plum tree and we we uh there's four of us me my wife my two daughters but we each make a cross out of this plum tree these twigs and we wrap them with yarn and i have uh anointing oil that i have from israel and you know anointing oil and in, in the christian faith um it's a representation of the holy spirit and so well, i often use that when we cleanse homes you know because we like i said we believe in demonic possessions and we perform um you know a christian version of uh, what catholicism calls exorcisms we we cleanse homes we deliver people from these strongholds and attachments of spirits and all this stuff you know so i have that and i and that's part of my job what i do i often go in our community and you know we do these things we pray for people and cleanse homes and what not so we take this anointing oil and we put it all over these crosses and we pray for these crosses and and we go to the four corners of our property and we bury these crosses underground and we pray we lay our hands on and we pray and we believe and we came together and we said you know what i think um the way this works if we put our faith into this that it's going to help us and so we prayed and we prayed that god would give us a hedge of protection on our property and and we believed it and we still do believe it and we hold on to that re really really tight like that's something we really hold dear to us is our faith and also we believe all four of us that our house and our property is protected and anointed and and what we like to call a hedge of protection so we buried them and we prayed and we we haven't had any situations happen after that and and we you know i i firmly believe that maybe our faith has has something to do with that maybe if we just believe in something so much that it's going to happen that it actually works and nothing has happened since we haven't had any more encounters nothing has you know come to the you know to our fence or on our roof or or anything like that just cuz it's a property thing and but as far as the canyon i mean i mean this canyon goes for hundreds of miles you know there's all kinds of crazy things down there and the the last weird thing that happened was on um new years you know we had a fireworks show i was i bought some fireworks and i bought this fountain a really good fountain a really cool one my kids love fireworks so we're at, it's nighttime and you know i have the lights on we we go to the streets and we light this fountain and it's you know it's like a minute long a really long fountain and it's like screaming popping doing all these colors my girls are giggling and dancing around and having a good time and during this firework as it's going off my wife's like what is that and uh, and I'm like what she was do you hear that and i could hear this like a screech howl scream all mixed into one really really weird coming from the canyon and it was just going and it started getting louder and louder and it, to where it was it was um you could really hear it compared to the fountain and my kids are listening like what the heck is that and then once the fountain stops this thing is still 
yelling or screaming, whatever you want to call it. And so it was coming from the canyon. It was the most angriest scream or like it was mad that we're doing this loud firework. And and it freaked me out because it's like, how can something scream that long? You know, it, it, unless it took a breath in there that I didn't catch and kept screaming, but it screamed louder than the fountain I had on, guys. And, and so whatever it was, had, I mean, it just had some massive lungs or something. And so... My kids are like, what the heck is that? And my daughter, we didn't tell my four-year-old what was going on. She, I personally thought she was too little to, to grasp the concept of it. And But my my older one knew what it, right away she knew what it was. My wife knew what it was. And I said, guys, let's go inside. Our fireworks show is cut short this year. And we came inside and, and we were like, man, whatever it was, did not like that we were doing that. You know, it, it just was pissed off i like to say excuse my language that we were doing that and that was the the last um actual whatever like encounter or odd thing that has happened um but absolutely nothing has happened um on our property you know and 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 i know that for a fact because like i said we haven't seen anything we haven't had the weird feelings but before we buried the crosses i mean i would wake up at night random times and my dog would be crying and the dog would be looking up at the wall, the, the wall that goes outside. And it's just, my dog just whimpering, looking at this wall. And I'm like, you know, in a half sleep, like, what are you doing? Like, get away from the wall. Like, what's wrong? Do you gotta go bathroom or something? And then I'm like, Oh, I, I think I know what's going on. Like there's something there outside. And she's just crying, trying to hide under the blankets and under because she's just a little dog. And that would happen a lot of times. As a matter of fact, you know, all the time, three or four in the morning around there, um, the dog would would be crying. And um, oftentimes my wife would be like, oh, she needs to go bathroom. I'm like, no, 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 we're not opening the door. You know, if she goes potty in here, I'm, I'm going to clean it up. I'll clean it up, but we're not putting her out there. And she won't go out. You know, she'll, I have a king size bed. So she'll go to the very middle of this. So I can't grab her because she knows that when, you know, she wakes us up at night, it's for her to go potty. And so I'll, I'll try and grab her, but she'll stay under there and hide and she won't come out. So we can't get her if we wanted to. We'd have to take off the mattress and, you know, move stuff around to get her. So we just leave her under there and then she'll come out in the morning and uh, go potty. So once we bear the crosses, none of that stuff happened. Like it was, it just completely stopped. And thinking about it, all these things that have happened to me and to my family, it definitely uh, changed the way we looked at things for sure. And just looking back at my life, I've had some strange things that have happened to me and I really didn't tie them together because like I said, I didn't know that there was different types of Bigfoot. I didn't know that there was creatures they called dog men. You know, I didn't know any of that. And, you know, I've moved um, back and forth from Texas and Idaho, you know, my whole life, you know, I'd spend a few years in Texas and I'd come back to Idaho, spend a few years here, go back to Texas and, the spot I lived in in Texas is called Hayes County, and it's a very unique area. There's a lot of woods, and it's a lot of uh, kind of like a swampy kind of a feel to it. When I was about nine years old, I was having a sleepover with a friend of mine, and we were in our living room, and we are watching a scary movie. I don't remember what movie it was. I think it was like a Jason or something. And we're eating, we have a bowl of snacks, and we're sitting on this this uh, bed it's a couch that turns into a bed and we're sitting there and and watching tv and my grandpa's room is is right next to the to the living room and in our back porch my grandpa had a massive back porch you know where there was another table out there and then there was another porch behind that and behind the house there was a lot of woods and we were watching this movie and we heard like a creek or like, like, you know, when you hear wood move in on the patio and we looked up, the door had a big window in it and you could see outside and we looked and there was nothing there, but we heard something and my, and I'm like, oh, it's just the scary movies that get into us, man. And we're laughing. And so I go back to digging into my snacks and we hear the creak again, but I didn't look this time. I just was looking for my snacks and the friend I was with just screams like 
bloody murder. He just screamed so loud out of complete fear. And I jumped and my snacks went everywhere. And he was pointing at the door. And I look and there's nothing there. And my grandpa comes running out and he has a shotgun. And he's like, what the heck's going on? And, and my friend says, uh, a baboon looked through the window of the door. And I'm like, what, baboon? I'm like, what? And my grandpa didn't hesitate. He turned on the floodlights and he ran outside with the shotgun loaded and he was looking and there was nothing there. And he was a really paranoid man. He had, he had a high fence. He would often have guard dogs and, you know, the spotlights. And he always kept his shotgun by his bed. And my friend swears up and down that a giant baboon looked at us through the window and he screamed and it ran away. The whole time, I didn't believe him. I thought, like, man, this movie's really messing with you, you know, this scary movie. But now, as an adult, and I think about it, I'm like, man, that was some kind of cryptid that, that heard us giggling and having fun. And it came out of those woods, and it looked at us through that window, and he described it as a baboon. And now I know there's different types of these creatures. Some of them, you know, have snouts. Some don't have snouts. You know, some have square teeth like a human others have canines you know just weird stuff and so i i believe that even back then that something did come out of those woods and uh and look at us and and i and i believe in bigfoot i've always believed you know being over there and again in hayes county my uncle who's from michigan um, like I said, my grandma's from Michigan, and so my uncle was born there, and, and he lives here in Twin Falls now. But he's traveled back and forth with us. You know, my whole family has. But he tells me that he was, um, as a teenager, was driving on one of those back roads in Hayes County, and that they were, um, him and his friends were smoking pot, that they were doing something they shouldn't have been doing. And they pulled over on the side of the road, and they were laughing and telling jokes, doing what they were doing and he my uncle was about 15 years old and he uh had his window down and the reeds or the bushes or whatever were about a foot from his open window and he says that all of them saw it but right where his window was open that two hands two massive hands opened up the reeds and he says the bigfoot leaned down and looked at him and he says that it looked at everybody in the car like it was sizing them up. And it was about a foot from my uncle's face. And he says that it had a big, nasty gash on its face. And it looked at him and then it just moved his hands. The reeds came back to where they're at and they heard it walking off. And it really traumatized them because it was like a foot from him. And it was, he said it was, it was the ugliest thing he's ever saw in his life. And of course, nobody believed them because they're getting high and so everybody dismissed his uh, story but he told me that when i was about eight or nine years old and uh, so i believed in in bigfoot i believed in cryptids and all that but i had no idea that that there were different types or much less that there would be a you know a dog man or anything like that so that's that's really um interesting and and just thinking about my area i live in now there is so many encounters guys and that's a big reason why i want to share this with everybody is it's just to be careful or practice caution and when there's signs that saying that you shouldn't be there try and heed those signs you know i wonder what would have happened if i wouldn't have went where i shouldn't have been going that night when i went in the canyon you know and we found some weird stuff too you know i found some really large canine tracks my friend who has a uh, St. Bernard who was with me walking, we saw these tracks and he, he's like, holy crap. He goes, look at that. And he goes, my St. Bernard is not even that big. And St. Bernard is, he has a full grown St. Bernard. So that St. Bernard track is smaller than this one. And it was a giant, looked like a wolf track with these huge nails. And it's following these deer that are in this canyon. You can see it like following them into the bushes. And I found um, these massive tracks, what I think were probably Bigfoot, you know, about 15, 16 inches long, twice as wide as my foot in a place where nobody should have been, you know. And, and we found down there, you're not supposed to camp in the canyon, but people do anyway. Um, there used to be a lot of homeless people. There's literally no homeless people. Very, very seldom you'll see one person, one homeless guy down there. 
um, they'll be fishing or something, but they, they don't stay at night down there anymore. But we found a tent. Well, I didn't find it. My good friend who we went and investigated, who's kind of went through all this with me, he found a tent and this tent. And I have pictures of that. It was a shredded up tent. And it was it, the campsite was scattered everywhere, and this tent was destroyed. And he found empty bullet casings around this tent, but there was no people. There was no, nobody there, and it was close to evening when he found this. So he hightailed it out of there, and because he said it looks fresh, like it, there was a fresh, you know, whatever happened, somebody had a rude awakening at night, and so he he got out of there and he came back the next day in the daylight, and it was all cleaned up. There was nothing there. The tent was gone. There was no more of those possessions that were there. There was no bullet casings. Everything was gone. Like, like somebody just kind of cleaned it up or whatever, you know, and, and then going back to the whistling bear, all the whistling bear encounters that we hear of this thing, walking the the railroad tracks and walking in the Canyon, you know, it's just, it's really interesting. And, and it really doesn't help that it's only 300 yards from my house, you know, where, where my family is and and where we live. And ever since this happened to me, I kind of, maybe I went a little overboard in in investigating and, and just researching my area, you know, because I want to find out like, has who else have seen this creature or creatures or whatever here. And there's a lot of mysterious stuff that happens like missing people. And I didn't know about any of this stuff, Vic, but when I had my encounter and my family's encounter, this whole missing 411 stuff, like the first documentary film was filmed like an hour from my house. The first one with David Pilates, the first one he made. And I was just, I'm just like, what? Are you kidding me? I'm like, what are the odds of that? And it's like not too far from where I live. And I just like, my mind just goes everywhere. I'm like, man, this thing really opened up more. It's like way more than what I thought it would be. And this cave the lava cave which is the largest lava cave in the world um it goes down it's just outside of twin falls maybe 20 minutes from twin and there's another one called the mammoth caves that's close to it you know where they found the woolly mammoth in there and the bones of it or whatever and there's a lot of ice in it so back in the day before refrigeration the ice industry was booming in twin falls because it was like one of the only places in the area where you could have a cold beer because they would harvest the ice out of this cave and, and it, they'd bring it up and they'd sell the ice or whatever. But I, I went down there to this cave and cause you can go down there and take tours, you know, it costs, I don't remember how much like $10 a person or whatever, but you can go down there and it's just literally this cave is huge. It is massive. It, it just goes and goes, but they, they only let the general public go down about half a mile. And so I made it about a quarter of a mile before I had to stop. Like it was just too much for me. It was really, really creepy. And there's a sign down there that says that there were reports of a cave bear living in this cave, but it was never found. There's just that people saw it and there's a sign on there. And as you're walking down in this darkness, man, there everywhere there's signs that says stay on the trail you know an exclamation mark stay on the trail and you go half a mile and it, and it blocks off to where you know the public can't go down there but it keeps going so i went down about a quarter of a mile and i came back up and i was way too freaked out and and then i went back after all these encounters and i just wanted to talk to this guy who uh who lives on the property where this cave's at and he told me that a family went down there and they never came out and that it didn't make the news, that it wasn't in the paper or anything, but that they had a lot of people who came to look for them. Like a lot of, he said, agencies or whatever came to try and find them. They never found the family and it's still open. Like anybody can go down there and it's not a guided tour. You go down there on your own and you can walk down there. And, but the family went down there and they never came out. And so, talk about adding to the creep factor after all these things that have happened. I mean, the rabbit hole just, it just doesn't stop, you know, just um, researching my area. um, There's a lot of, I mean, it just keeps going and going, man, of, of the whistling bear. There's a, a story that I know about that. I don't know the guy, but I have a good friend who knows him and he's a photographer and he he gives his pictures to National Geographic, Discovery, 
and he lives in a town um, that's called Sun Valley. And it's about, I'd say, about 45 minutes from Twin Falls or so. And it's up in the Solitude Mountains, beautiful area. But he has a huge camera and he'll go out and he'll hike and he'll spend days out there capturing uh, footage of the wildlife. Beautiful um, pictures and stuff. But he says that he was out there and he found a, a herd of elk. And he was following these elk, taking pictures. And then he found a small group of four uh, big bucks these huge males and he was he's really far he has his lens that's really really huge and so he's he's hiding and he's he always wears camo because he doesn't want to be seen he covers his sand all that stuff and then he's out there and he's taking pictures of these elk and he says all of a sudden these giant wolves come running out of the tree line and because they're in this little field opening and he says that they run so fast that they grab these elk. There's like two or three, I think he said three of them, of these wolves. And he says they were so huge that they were um, about the size of the elk themselves. And they were so big. But he says when they ran, he says that they had hands and they were ripping the legs off of the elks, that they weren't trying to dispatch them right away. He says that they would grab with their hands and rip off a leg and throw it. And they'd rip off another leg and grab the other elk and rip off their limbs. And he says his camera, that it's a really high-tech camera, and he was in shock, so he went to take pictures, and he says his camera would not get a photo of these things. He says it, it would go blurry. He'd hit to take the picture, and it wouldn't take a picture. He'd take a picture, and it'd take a picture of a thing on the other side, like a random spot. And he says whatever they were, that he believes it was some kind of like and he, this, by the way, this guy is, uh, he's a proclaiming atheist. Like he doesn't believe in paranormal or supernatural things or whatever. But he said that it made him wonder how can something like that mess up his camera? How can it cause his camera to glitch? And he says that they were so huge too. He's like, and they had hands and he's, he's convinced that it's just some kind of undocumented, you know, wolf hybrid or something. But he says that he's so far away that there's no way that these things would have saw him. But he's looking at his, through his camera and he says one of them sticks his nose in the air and he says it looks right at him and he's far, far away. And he says it looks right at him and they all stop and they all look at him and they start moving in his direction and he hightails it. He says he leaves some of his stuff there. He just grabs his main camera and he, he goes booking it and he's not too far from the trail that leads him to his vehicle and he's running with all of his might and he says when he gets into the vehicle finally that he could hear the crashing of trees out in the distance and he just books it and he goes and that happened just outside of Sun Valley, so it's not too far uh, from where I live. But he thinks they are some kind of hybrid dire wolf or a buffalo wolf or or something like that, you know. And again, he's real adamant of what he saw because he, he does that for a living. And another weird thing that remembering as a kid, my aunt, my mom's sister, she had a boyfriend um, in Hayes County, and this one when I was about 13. And I had a really mean pit bull. This dog was really mean. And I couldn't even feed it. It was so vicious. Like I would put its food in a bowl and with a stick, I'd move it towards him. And he would just devour the food. Well, my aunt's boyfriend, uh, he's a Hispanic guy. Um, he looks at me and he tells me, he goes, your, he goes, your dog is actually a little sissy. And I told him, I'm like, man, this dog is vicious. Like he'll probably eat you. And he goes, nope. He goes, I'll prove it to you. He walks over to my dog and my dog is growling at him. And he just kind of opens up his arms and leans into the, this pit bull. And my pit bull rolls over on his side. And, and he kind of like puts his ears down, tails between his legs. And I can't believe it. I'm like, what the heck just happened? And, and he tells me, and this is, this is what he said. He said that he was walking in the desert in uh, Hayes County and he saw a, a dog that was walking like a man. And he says that the dog talked to him in Spanish and he didn't talk back to it, but he just, he was out there doing whatever he was doing in the desert and saw it. And he says, but when he looked into his eyes and the thing spoke to him and his language, he says it really messed him up. And ever since then, he's been able to, read dogs or whatever in a different way and so again i kind of blew that off as oh that's my aunt's crazy boyfriend he doesn't really uh you know why would he say that he's just you know must have been 
you know, drugs or something I thought as a kid. But now looking back at it, I'm like, what? I'm like, that is really weird that he would tell me this. And and I've heard stuff like that after researching. I've heard weird things like this of these things doing odd stuff. And it's um, it's weird of, because they look flesh and blood, but they do really weird stuff. I mean, what what follows you home and what takes joy out of harassing your family and your kids and and it's it's always like it was one step ahead of me man i felt like that like it was one step ahead of me it show itself i go there'd be nothing in the canyon when i lunged at my daughter it ran and it showed itself just where there would be no evidence left of it you know and one night we saw in the canyon this uh it was in the evening this huge buck deer it was a buck deer but its leg was twisted off and like it was just twisted it was dangling its back leg and it was it wasn't running away from us it was staying close to us and i remember thinking i'm like what the heck this huge animal is like literally 10 feet from us and and we're walking away and it's trying to stay close to us and we notice his leg is just dangling and so that makes me think like what has the strength to twist you know, a full grown. And we, here in Idaho, we have really big deer. The bucks are huge. And so for his leg just to be dangling down, it's, it's weird. Like what could do that? You know, my mind now says, I know it did that. You know, it's a very weird area how this dog man followed me and it showed itself. But also we hear a lot of Bigfoot encounters, the whistling bear, you know, all these encounters down here. So it's like, I don't know if they, if they live in this canyon area or if they just travel up and down because like i said it goes for for hundreds of miles and thinking back about weird things that have happened to me in my life um there's a town called wendell which wendell and gooding it's, it's about an hour maybe 45 minutes away from twin falls and it's in the magic valley and uh, people who know my area will know exactly what i'm talking about but my mom's ex-boyfriend his nephew he's like two years old came up missing he's still missing he's on the idaho missing kids thing here in idaho like you you can still see him his last name is morales i forget his first name but you guys can look him up his last name is morales but he was two years old and this was when i lived in gooding at the time and he came up missing and it was a big old thing all over the news but the dogs, I didn't know that then, but now I know like looking at all the reports on online of it. So this little kid comes up missing two years old and the dogs, they bring the dogs in to track them. Well, they catch his scent and they follow his scent. I mean, it was a, at least a mile away from where he came up missing. And there was, um, he passed through a large field. They followed his, his scent through a large field, through an abandoned railroad system like you know it has where the railroad w would connect and there was a building there that's an abandoned one they followed him through that they followed him through another field okay and he's two years old and then the trail stopped at the river and all they found was his little shoe his l one shoe is all they found on this riverbed and the dogs couldn't find his scent after that and so what they did was they drained the river they checked up and down the river because it's a massive long long river and they never found his body and he's still missing to this day but now looking back at it it's like really weird stuff you know after researching the 411 and all that with with little kids moving great distances and really short amount of time well that happened to my to it hits home with me because you know i, I actually knew the kid you know when this happened i was probably about maybe eight years old and so he was a little kid, but I, I've known him and we played outside together and stuff. So those things really hit home with me. And, you know, thinking about there's another one here called and and by the way, like I was into Bigfoot, but not like I am now or Dogman. Like I just wanted to research and and just find out mainly my area. And there's another report from Twin Falls where a guy who's driving by his farm, he, he has a farm and his animals, some of his goats would come up missing and he assumed it was a mountain lion. So he took his precautions or whatever, but he says he was, he was checking on his property at night and he was driving and he saw a timber wolf. He says it's a timber wolf, but it was on two legs. 
and it was holding something. And he found out it was holding a goat, one of his goats in his two hands. And then he says when it, he he hit it with his uh, headlights when he was driving on his property. So it was just a quick flash when he was turning. He saw he saw the wolf walking on two legs and it was holding one of his goats. And he stopped and he and he turned his vehicle and it was gone. Like there was nothing there. But he swears up and down that it was a timber wolf that was walking on two legs. And he doesn't know. He doesn't assume that it was a dog man or anything. He just he just thinks that this dog was or this wolf somehow figured out how to be on two legs or maybe it saw him and it stood up on two legs just to see what like what was going on. You know, some sometimes dogs do weird stuff. But the fact that it was holding something in his arms, that one really was really weird. And the reason why my good friend, when I called him over to look at my roof. I told him, hey, bro, you got to come look at the roof. Look at these tracks because he's hunted all of his life and and he knows what's up with all the wildlife in the area. And right away, he said, nope, that's a dog man. And he began to tell me his encounter of what traumatized him as a kid. So he's lived in Washington. He's coming back and forth from Washington, but he's been here for since he was 15 years old or so now. But he says in Washington, when he was a little kid, maybe about four or five, that he saw what he describes them, he has two of them, as I think a Gamork, the servant of um, of the great nothing from the never-ending story, that wolf-like creature. He said that he, he looked out his window and he saw their, this is the, their eyes looked like orange or like fire, he says. And he says they were just standing there looking at him with their mouths open, you know, like they were panting and drooling. Like his mind said they wanted him. And he said that they looked like they were all matted up, covered in mud or something on their body. And he says it traumatized him so much that he didn't speak for a whole year. Like a whole year, he went through counseling, all this stuff. And then he didn't speak for a year. All he could do was write or like draw pictures to communicate with people. That's how bad it screwed him up. And now he believes that those two things that he saw were dogmen that he saw outside of his window. So that's why he's a, he's a big believer in it. And his dad is the first one who told him about the whistling bear when he was a kid, that his dad, his dad saw the whistling bear walking up the canal system. There's a lot of canals here in the magic Valley. So he says that he saw the bear walking on two legs and it was whistling in the canal. It's a massive canal system that goes all through magic Valley. And so and this was in Kimberly where his dad first saw this. And now his dad lives in Wendell, Wendell Gooding area where I said that the little kid came up missing, but his dad says that he's had encounters with this creature there in Wendell because he lives right on the outskirts of town. And he says that he, he associates it with the bear. He says he smells just this horrific smell. And he says that he was walking his dog one night and he has a little Yorkie or some little tiny dog. He's a, And this guy is really old, like in his 70s or something, maybe his 80s. And he's walking his dog and he says he smells this bear smell that he often smells in the area. And he says that he hears just this massive thumping of something in the dark running. And he says when he hears it, his dog just rolls over and pees on itself and starts crying and he could hear all the dogs in the neighborhood in the town screaming and barking. And he could hear this thing getting farther and farther and farther. And um, just recently, he's told me, he told me that he found um, these massive tracks outside of his window and Wendell that he had the feeling again, like, hey, this thing. And his dad believes that it's uh, some kind of attachment, like there's some kind of supernatural aspect of it because he says it's followed him his whole life. As a kid in Kimberly, he saw it, and for some we reason, it followed him to Wendell, and it and it like harasses him, like it it'll scratch his house. He'll hear uh, howls or screams outside of his house, and he says recently, a few weeks ago, a matter of fact, that he saw something outside of his window, and he's a uh, you know he's older, so he sends he calls my friend, and he drives down there, and he finds these massive three toed tracks. They look like they're three toes and they're huge and they have like an eight foot stride in between these steps. And so, we, they don't, I mean, we don't know what it is, but his dad swears up and down that it's the whistling bear that has been harassing him all these years. And 
another interesting thing is and thank you guys for listening to me i know i got a lot of stories but believe me when something like this happens to you you either want to shut it down and never think about it again or you want to research it or sometimes both you know for my wife for one she refuses to speak about it she won't speak about it you know she we talked about it twice like me and her one on one and she gets really scared she begins to shake and she does not want to talk about it and her belief is if you talk about it it's going to conjure it or it's going to somehow draw it back to us and so she that's her view on it is that she doesn't so she doesn't even mess with it anymore you know she doesn't want to talk about it she doesn't want anything to do with it i don't necessarily agree with that but that's what she believes you know and uh you know the whole area like i said has all these crazy encounters and these weird stories of and that's only on i'm touching base mostly on like dogman creature or or creatures that just have snouts you know and walk on two legs and there's so many bigfoot encounters in this area man there's there's a really interesting one on the canyon rim where the a boyfriend and girlfriend were camping out on the canyon rim in a tent and they swear that a bigfoot put its head inside the tent and looked at them and she got so scared she passed out she fainted and the i guess the boyfriend left her he ran and left her there and got in his vehicle and left and so she passed out and when she woke up she came to he was gone and she had to stay there in that tent terrified just terrified out of her mind until he came back to pick her up and so um pretty sure you guys would agree with me that they're no longer together right for her to be left there alone when something like that happens you know so all this area man it's really frightening but um i want to know more about it but uh, at the same time it's like man i don't know if i want to go there all the time and i've taught i've shared the stories some with people and and i've been judged and i've been you know called crazy and then for those who do believe they say well why would you take your daughter on this canyon rim and go for a bike ride you know why would you put yourself in that situation well the thing is guys like this is my home like i live here it's not like i get all geared up when we go for a drive to go to these areas is literally down the street and the, it's just a beautiful area and so i've come to the conclusion that you know i'm not going to let this thing keep me in a box you know i'm not going to let these creatures here keep me in a box you know like i want to i go fishing you know i go hiking me and my wife we go camping all the time every year we go camping in the summer we make beautiful moments and and we love it but we it changes us in a way where we we know these things are real you know we we know they're out here and it's just like am i going to just hide myself and never go outside you know or am i going to enjoy god's creation you know i believe god created this beautiful scenery for especially like for me to enjoy and to go watch my kids smile when they catch their fish in the stream and stuff just really really cool stuff and you know people can say what they want of of me going down there and and still going down there for family walks and going for hikes and stuff you know it's that it is what it is in the summer time or fall or spring me and my friend we take our lunch breaks and we go down in the canyon and we just walk and we're not alone there's always people down there not much well just so you guys know Idaho is not a very small state and there's only 1.7 million people in my whole state and most of those people live in the towns so when you go hiking or you go camping out in the mountains or in the wilderness you'll never see anybody because they're like i said 1.7 million people in the whole state and so camping is a big thing but we would go down to the canyon and walk on our lunch breaks and me and my friend talk about spiritual stuff you know um we talk about scripture and stuff and and we talk about cryptid things and and but we've been down there and we've gotten lost a couple times in a place that you should not get lost like we just weird like you almost get disoriented and we've got separated before um uh, we've seen weird stuff like we've seen like a white mist kind of a thing or like a almost like a smoke or something just appear out of nowhere and deep down in the bush we found baby strollers um we found ripped up clothes thrown up in the trees just really 
really weird stuff that we've we've found and and again it's where i live everybody and a big reason why i want to share this with people and i tell people i don't have time to make up these stories i try to be a man of integrity you know i have a lot of people looking up to me i do a lot of family counseling there's a lot of stuff that we do and everybody knows who we are in this city you know cuz it's one of the best schools in the state and it's just a a great tight knit community and so people know me and and i just i want to share it like so people can just be cautious you know when they go down there and for some reason it seems like it's the fall the fall months and the colder months is when is when a lot of the reports happen when a lot of uh weird things happen is more in the fall and colder months for some reason which i don't really know about why that would happen but but that's what it is and there's recently um a it was this happens quite often not a lot but there's a lot of people that come up missing in Idaho there's not many people here but when somebody goes missing everybody hears about it and i have a on my phone a screenshot of a car that wrecked on the side of the canyon and it went into the canyon and there's no bodies in it the people were missing and that does not like rare around here where you'll find abandoned vehicles in the canyon or on the canyon rim or even like they wreck and like they get on their side on the ditch and there's nobody there like they never find the people they just come up missing and so like that is just weird too where cuz i've heard stories of of these creatures running in front of roads and you know trying to cause wreck or they just want to scare you or try to get you out of the vehicle and and there are vehicles that are found and there's nobody there you know nobody there and so it's definitely a interesting area that we live in but it's beautiful at the same time you know it really is beautiful so that's pretty much what's been going on here in my area and just some of the accounts that have happened and you know my friend he has so many more accounts you know that he's oh, and that's what he does he just researches and and meets people and and does all that so i'm sure there's a lot of a lot of other um scary stuff out there but that's my story man and that's what happened to me and my wife and my kids and something followed me home and it took joy showing itself to my wife and my kids and and i would think like i was getting mad I'm like why won't it show itself to me? Why does it like it it's always one step ahead of me and it's harassing my family. And again, that's the predatory thing. Like when something wants to hurt women and kids and it's but it doesn't want to, you know, it wants to do women like mess with women and kids. That's that's dark for me. That's a little that's more on the darker side. So that's kind of where I'm at and and we just we don't go at night anymore walking on the canyon and we don't go in the canyon when it's dark we try to take precautionary measures i don't know what good it'll do but we never go unarmed we're always armed when we go down there like i said we have firearms we have security system um just try to do whatever measures but i honestly believe the crosses and our family believing with all of our hearts that those crosses were going to help us i i believe it did help us and it's um we have had anything happen on our property since so that's everything in a nutshell vic wow chewy you sure do have a lot of bad things going on in your area that's horrible before i ask you some questions about your encounters you sent me some pics that show some of the things you just told us about while i display them for the listeners one by one please tell us what we're looking at so one of them is the tracks of my roof and you're going to see my my vinyl fence cuz you know my roof is so tall i had to I had to get behind to take a picture of it but you're going to see um tracks of 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 this creature walking on my roof and and if you zoom in on these pictures you're going to see what i'm talking about you're going to see that they're like triangle looking tracks you know weird and again like after my re- like just kind of learning more about this I've actually seen pictures of tracks like that of of reportedly dogman tracks where it looks just like a like a elongated canine track with like you know how a dog has heels it can sometimes get down on his heel or something that's what it kind of looks like like uh there's footprints up there and so that's my roof and it's a really tall house and there's no way that 
a person can get up. You know, I mean, you need, you're going to need a, at least a 20 foot ladder to get up there, you know? So there's that picture. And then there's another one of the, the main Canyon, which is a snake river Canyon. And it has the prime bridge where people um, base jump off of there, but you're going to look down there. And I'm pretty sure if you zoom in, you're going to find little black dots on the Canyon wall. And those are caves and they're everywhere. The caves are endless. They're everywhere. And as you go down, and this this bridge is um, taller than the Golden Gate Bridge from San Francisco. It's like 206 feet or something like that here in Twin. So it's a really, really deep canyon with the, the bridge. It's, it's really cool. But you're going to look down there, and there's a Snake River. And the Snake River goes all across. I mean, it just goes for hundreds of miles. And you're going to see um, all the the trees and the brush, all the greenery down there that's right next to the river. But that's the main canyon. And then the picture, the other picture, which is a um, a canyon rim trail, is actually uh, the one here by my house. It's a small, it's a smaller canyon. But again, you're going to see the canopy that I'm talking about. You're going to see how it's just completely covered. And it's just a beautiful area. And then there's uh, there's another one of another canyon or the same canyon but a different location one of the smaller canyons um there one one day i went down there as i was doing a wedding because you know i'm a pastor I, I do weddings and you know do a lot of stuff like that i think i was doing a a, a funeral that day or something like some i pretty sure it was but i was going for a walk down there um after i did this um this reception it was like a get together of, of the family who lost a a loved one but i the they blocked off this this little trail and they put do not enter and they put this you know caution stuff around it and and one of the one of the guys who worked down there because it's a park it's a park area where you can have it's beautiful you can fish you can boat and that's where we had that event and so there's groundskeepers that live down there they actually have houses who live down there and i asked him i'm like hey why is this blocked off and he says, somebody reported a wild animal down here. And I told him, well, I'm like, really? I'm like, what kind of wild animal? He goes, I don't know. He goes, the city wouldn't tell me. They just told me I had to put something up. So somebody has a visual barrier not to cross and go down in there. So that's uh, the pictures. And I, I'm not sure if I sent you the one with the tent. If not, I, I'd be happy to send that. But it, it's a red tent and it's just shredded. It's thrown. And that's the story I told you guys about with the empty bullet casings and the possessions thrown everywhere. And somebody cleaned it up the very next day. Well, like I said, that sure is a lot of strange activity in your area. Yeah, when you're out and about, it would be prudent to keep your head on the swivel. How big would you say the dogman is that's been stalking you, Jewy? Well, when I saw it in the canyon, we estimated it to be eight foot tall eight to nine foot tall right around there and just the the bulk of it i mean we we put it it had to be at least 400 pounds just how big it was and for it to cross a 30 foot trail i mean something across 30 feet and three stride and it wasn't like a it wasn't running you know it it was weird it was like it was almost like it it wasn't jumping when it crossed it was I'm trying to, it's really weird trying to wrap my mind around it, but it didn't look like the head moved. Like it was almost like a, like a, not floating. I don't want to say floating because we saw its legs hit the ground, but it, its body didn't move. Only its legs did when it crossed, you know, like a person, when we cry, you're going to see a person go up and down. It, is, it almost looked like it just was, it was uniform when it went across, you know, and then, you know, my fence being, you know, seven plus foot tall, you know, I think whatever it was, was on, on all fours, or maybe it was crouched down. And, and when it showed itself, my wife says it was well over the seven foot fence, like its head was all well over it. And so, you know, I think that it was listening to her and listening to her doing a recording and wanted to scare the crap out of her or, or whatever. And it did that. So it had, it, it's, I know it's at least seven foot to be able to look over that fence, right? And so she didn't see it walking. She's just seen it pop its head up. And then when she looked, when she freaked out, it was gone. 
So I, I assume it was either crouching or it was on all fours when it showed itself. And, and um, my daughter, when we, when she saw it on the Canyon rim, I showed her pictures, not of the dog man, but I was showing her pictures of bears and she's like, yeah, I kind of look like a black bear, you know? And then I showed her pictures of a, of a black wolf. And she's like, that's kind of more what it looked like. She goes, it looked more like that one, but it was bigger like a bear. So she says the size of the head and the neck were more bearish, but it looked more like one of those black wolves. So I, th I think it, ha it has to be like a, I'm going to say like an eight foot creature that's been coming around, you know. I mean, something that can jump up on a roof, but it didn't leave scratch marks. Like I was thinking, like if it got on my roof, I went out there several times and walked around and I've analyzed this. And I'm like looking for the lowest point of my roof. There's no scratches. There's nothing like, how can it do that? You know, how can it, it has to be a huge agile creature to just to jump up there, you know? Yeah, these things can jump like it's going out of style. So I know it's hard to wrap your head around, but it doesn't surprise me. But having said that, it's about time for us to get out of here. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Yeah. Well, I just, first of all, want to, you know, say thank you for letting me be on the show and sharing my stories of what happened to us here and, and all the encounters in my area. And, and I pretty much already know, like, there's going to be people who do a disagree with me going back down there and then taking my daughter down there and, you know, going on the, the hikes and the Canyon rim and all that. But I just really want to hit that home. Like, I mean, not intentionally going down there with my family to get a rise out of something down there. I really, really am not. And especially now after everything that's happened, it's like, if we go down there, it's, it's for family purposes and it's in the daytime and, for those of you who know my area, who live in this area, just be careful and just know that, that these things are real, that stuff like this happens. And again, I don't, I don't have time to make up these stories. I'm a really busy man. I got a lot on my plate with what I do as a pastor and overseeing my school and raising my kids and trying to be the best husband that I can. Like this is just the way it is here where I live. You know, it's, it's down the street from my house and, I wish I could tell you guys that it doesn't phase me anymore, that I'm over it, that I manned up, but I am freaked out when I go to throw the garbage at night. And I try to, every day when I come home, I'm like, okay, get everything. So I do not have to come outside to my vehicle. Like I still do that. It still hits home for me. And, and my wife is the same way. You know, there's still part of it that is with us, you know, and I don't know if it'll ever leave, but my wife is, doing better but like i said it she won't talk about it she just she she refuses to and i'll never forget that feeling man of looking into her eyes and her just begging me like what did you do or make it stop you know and i can't you know so these things are real and just be careful when you guys go to the canyon area just try and go in the daytime and go with people take dogs with you if you can and just practice caution, but don't let these things make you live like a hermit. Enjoy God's creation and make the most of it. Well, that's all very well said. Chewie, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the details of all those experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Vic. I appreciate it too. Well, you know, you're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.